in the summer of 69, um, in those halcyon days between primary school and secondary school, I was the owner of a brand new, beautiful, blonde, genuinely Spanish guitar. Someone showed me four chords and I thought, okay, what do I do now? So I was riffling through my sister's record collection. I found this record with a black and white cover and it just was called Joan Byers Volume 2. I'd never heard of her. Uh, I flipped it over and on the back, she was sitting in dappled shade playing a Spanish guitar. I put it on the old gramophone, as it was then, and the first track was unaccompanied, which was kind of disappointing. The second one was The Trees They Do Grow High, which is quite a famous folk song. That was too complicated for me, too many bar chords. And then we got into things like Barbara Allen, Banks of the Ohio, Plaisir d'Amour. Uh, you know, we needed sort of four, maybe five chords. I could do that. And then I found two records of hers in the school library, her debut album, 1960, and Joan Byers Volume 5, which contained There But For Fortune, which I knew. So the songs were sort of in my mind's ear. I thought, yeah, I know some of this stuff already. Uh, Joan Byers Volume 5 also contained an amazing track, uh, Bachianas Brasileiras, which was sort of merging of Brazilian folk song and Bachian tradition by Hector Villalobos. And it's the most extraordinary piece uh, for soprano and eight cellos. And I realised at that point that she had a, a truly beautiful voice. And I was really hooked. And it was a combination of the voice, which really affected me and moved me. And just, you know, I just was intrinsically attracted to it. And then uh, the gradual realisation that she was this sort of zealot figure that had been present at so many major events, which were then only very recent history. I mean, the March on Washington was sort of six years old. Um, Martin Luther King was a year dead when I began listening to this. And she was a sort of Venn diagram through which I began to explore from North London in the late 60s and very early 70s, when all my school friends were listening to Donny Osmond and David Cassidy and whoever else, the Bay City Rollers. I began exploring that, so I was going home from school and listening to Byers and Dylan, Judy Collins, Janice Ian, uh, Leonard Cohen. The first time I met her was very briefly after a concert at the Rainbow Theatre in December 1971. And my parents said, you're not going on your own. So they took me and they loved it because they really liked her voice actually. And they waited patiently uh, in the December drizzle and cold um, for her to come out and I got an autograph and of course I thought that would be the only time I'd ever see her and I've met her on lots of occasions since and I was in I was dispatched to New York in 1995 by Mojo to report on two of the four sessions for the live album that became Ring the Bells and that was that was very exciting so Janice Ian, Mary Black, the McGarrigals, uh, Mary Chapin Carpenter I thought I'd died and gone to heaven I was in this Greenwich Village club it was the first time I'd been in the village what I've tried to do is show how important she was as a musician and how much she did in the field of social activism and how those two strands of her life were woven together right the way through. I mean, for a lot of the time, from the 60s really until, until about 1990, those mu music often played second fiddle to her political interests. And she was brave. She went to lots of uh, quite dangerous places, including Sarajevo during the siege. So I've tried, I've tried to give context to her work. I've tried to show where the social conscience came from. She came to prominence in a very particular time. I think the 1960s, when the kind of dull grey of the Eisenhower years turned to Kennedy Technicolor, and the baby boomers found their voice, and then there was Vietnam, she would say was the glue that brought youth together. So she was very much part of the scene. I've been writing this book in parallel with uh, creating a festival in Greenwich Village, which should be in its third incarnation now as we speak. And I wouldn't be doing the village trip uh, had I not discovered Joan Myers uh, 50 years ago, as I told her. So it's, been, it's very, been a very enriching journey. I've learned a lot writing it. I think you'll learn a lot reading it. I certainly hope so. And I hope it, crucially, it'll take you back to the music, because that's the most important thing. And at this point in our lives, we all need music more than ever.